Well, we are continuing to walk through some gospel stories in the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 4 this morning. This is Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, and for some it'll be a very familiar story. So this, uh, this journey we're taking towards Easter, towards the cross, if you look at the front of your bulletin, it says, take another look. <laughs> so even if this story is familiar to you, I'm inviting you to take another look, to set aside perhaps what you already think about this story and leave room for God to give you a fresh perspective. So John chapter 4, <clears throat> starting with verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tried, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. <clears throat> How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. I want to pause there. We'll, we'll come back to verse 27 in just a minute. But I want to walk through this story with you. Jesus and his disciples were, were um, baptizing, and the Pharisees heard about it, and there was a little bit of a controversy, and so Jesus just moved on. He went from Judea to Galilee. Now, John, the gospel writer here, says, now he had to go through Samaria, which is really not true. He didn't have to go through Samaria. He had an option. He could have taken a longer road and gone around Samaria, which, as those who were reading the gospel at the time John wrote it would have known, is what any good Jew would have done, because Jews did not associate with Samaritans. They just didn't do it. And to even walk through Samaria was to take the chance of being contaminated by the Samaritans. So here Jesus is. 
and he's chosen the road that goes through Samaria. So once again, Jesus is setting an example for his disciples that the things that the religious people are concerned about are not necessarily the things that Jesus himself is concerned about. He takes the road through Samaria. When he comes into Sychar, near this plot of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph, and he sat down at Jacob's well, he sent his disciples off to get food from the town, which is another big no-no because they, in order to get food, we're going to have to purchase food from Samaritans, right? So that food would have been considered unclean. So now he's walking through Samaria. Now he's going to eat Samaritan food. Oh, can you believe it? And so when this woman comes to the well to draw water, it's about noon. It's about the middle of the day. Pretty hot. Sun's shining. And she just comes to do her business and leave. She didn't come to have a conversation. She didn't come to interact with anyone. If she wanted to talk with people, she would have come very early in the morning while it was still cool. And that's when everyone gathered at the well. That's when everyone got there, drew their water, engaged in a little gossip, and then went about their daily work. The fact that she's there in the middle of the day says... I am not interested in a conversation. I am not interested in connecting with people from my village. I am not interested in what they have to say, particularly what they have to say about me. So she comes, and Jesus asks her for a drink of water, which totally throws her off because she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew. She knows the rules. Why doesn't he know the rules? In fact, I think that when she says this to him, she's like, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? It seems to me that she is pushing back, right? She came to the well. She just wanted to get her water and go. She was not interested in connecting with people and talking to people. And here's this guy sitting at the well, and he's like, hey, can you give me a drink? When she looks at him, she can clearly see that this is a Jewish man. Not only is he a Jew and she's a Samaritan, he's a man and she's a woman. So she points at him and she goes, how can you ask me for a drink? How is this even happening right now? Do you understand the rules of your religion and culture? Because I know them. I think she knew them really well. But here's Jesus. And if there's one thing that I've learned in walking with Jesus, it's that when I throw up a wall, Jesus just very deftly steps around it. <laughs> so she goes, how can you ask me for a drink? You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. This is not how this is done. And he says to her, well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He didn't even respond to her question. He didn't even, he didn't even say, well, here's why. I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. I came to break down walls and barriers between cultural groups so that we can all worship God together. No. He doesn't even answer her question. He just steps around it. And he says, I might have something to offer you. I might have something to offer you. Which, of course, just throws her for another loop. You know? It just, you don't have a bucket. <laughs> you don't have a jar. The well is really deep. How is it that you are going to give me water? You just asked me for a drink. You don't have anything to draw with. I don't understand this. How are you going to give me a drink? Are you greater than Jacob, our father? It's a little sarcasm in there. Are you great, Mr. Big Shot? Are you greater than Jacob, our father, who 
dug this well up, who gave us this well, who drank from it himself with his sons and his flocks and his herds? Are you bigger than him? Jesus says, again, does he answer her question? No. (laughs) Here she is, right? You can't give me a drink of water. Wall. Jesus, around the edge. Just around the edge. Everyone who drinks the water, this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. It'll well up within him as a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So then she calls his bluff. I just think she's a tough lady. I think she's just, I think she's just tough, a little rough around the edges. So she calls his bluff. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water from this well, this well that she had just gotten through saying was super, right? This is the best well ever given to us by Jacob who drank out of it. And now she says, give me this water so that I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. And so Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. So what you've said is true. This is the first time that she asks him, that she makes a statement and he responds to what she said. It's the first time in this whole conversation that she says something and he directly responds to what she has said. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus just looks at her and says, you're right, you don't. And I know. And I've known since the beginning of the conversation. And I've still talked to you. What you've said is true. We don't know her circumstances. We don't know if she was married five times to men who died. We don't know if she was married and divorced five times. We don't know. We don't get any information about why it was that she had had five husbands. We do know that when Jesus was asked about divorce, the question that was asked to him was, Isn't it okay for us to divorce our wives for any and every reason? So we know that in that culture at that time, people think that we have it bad now with a 50% divorce rate, right? People think we have it bad now. People bemoan the fact that marriage is unstable. But at that time, all a man had to do was write a certificate of divorce, give it to his wife, send her on her way. And apparently they did. To the point that when Jesus was asked about divorce, can we divorce our wives for any and every reason? And he says, no. No. Moses gave you a certificate of divorce because your hearts were hard. He says, uh, unless there's been an actual break in the covenant of marriage, if you divorce, you commit adultery. Which is not the unforgivable sin, Right? He didn't say that, but people stopped following him. His disciples, the people who stuck with him said, oh, if this is the way it's going to be between a man and a woman, who would even get married? These are the good guys. So we know that their culture, in their culture, divorce was not something that was rare was not something that people took super seriously. So it's possible that she's had five husbands who've all divorced her. No wonder the man she's with now, they're not married. No wonder. You get your heart smashed into a million pieces five times. No wonder. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. She's done talking about herself now. (laughs) Done talking about herself. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews claim we have to worship in Jerusalem. 
What's that? Another wall. <laughs> Another wall. She's a person who's been hurt a lot. That's what we do when we've been hurt, right? We put up walls between ourselves and other people so that they can't hurt us. So she says, I see you're a prophet. Answer me this religious question, prophet. Where are we supposed to worship? Here or there? Where? And Jesus comes back with, believe me, a time is coming when it's not going to matter. This mountain, Jerusalem, wherever, because God is interested in people who will worship him in spirit and truth. God is not concerned about a mountain or a hilltop or a temple. God wants people to worship him in spirit and truth. Which I believe is an invitation. It's an invitation from Jesus to her. And what does she do? Wall. <laughs> oh, well, I know that the Messiah, I know he's coming. He'll, he'll answer all our questions when he gets here. And Jesus says the one thing that she was never expecting. I, who speak to you, am he. Let's pick up with 27. Then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one dared ask, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. His disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him some food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four more months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Throughout their conversation, she just kept throwing up those walls, throwing up those walls because she doesn't know him. Right? You and I know that it's Jesus. <laughs> We're in on the secret. She doesn't know. She doesn't know him. And when he finally says to her, I who speak to you am he, something changed. Something in her changed. Here is a prophet. Here is the Messiah. Here is one sent from God. And he's talking to me. She leaves her water jar, which is expensive. <laughs> this is not something you just walk away from. And hurries back to town so that she can tell all of those people that she didn't want to talk to before. That she was avoiding by going to the well at noon. She goes to tell every one of those persons she can find. I have met the Messiah. I have met a man. He's here. He's at our well. And he just told me everything I ever did. Come. Come. This is the Christ. Come. And they come. They come. Because nothing makes more of a difference than somebody who is hard-edged. Somebody whose life is full of walls. Suddenly having that change of heart. Suddenly she's seeking them out. Suddenly she has something to say to them about something important. Something vital. If she's talking about the Messiah, it must be true. If she's talking about God, it must be true. 
It's normal for people who are pastors, people who grow up in the church, normal for us to talk about God. When somebody who's hard-edged, who lives their life behind layers and layers and layers of walls, when they start talking about Jesus, it makes a huge impact. His disciples come back. They don't understand what's going on. They, they never do, bless their hearts. They're always clueless. And Jesus patiently, patiently sticks with them. He says, we're here to reap a harvest that you didn't plant. <laughs> and they stay in that area for two days. We've got Jesus breaking convention all over the place. He goes through Samaria. He stops at the well. He sends them for food. He asks her for a drink. He's talking to Samaritans about God. And he chooses to stay in their area for two more days. He's throwing it all out the window. He's not letting divisions that society has put in place, that religion has put in place, that culture has put in place. He's sweeping them all away. He's not letting those walls stand between him and people that God loves. Not letting them stand between him and the harvest that's ready and waiting. When Jesus speaks to this woman at the well, she has so many things, so many reasons, so many things against her. She's a woman. She's a Samaritan. She's had a storied past. So many things that other people would say disqualify her from God's love, and so many things that she herself believes disqualify her from God's love. But Jesus walks into her life and showers her with grace showers her with grace, and you can see it when he offers her living water. You can see it when he points to her honesty, when he tells her that while people may not have a good understanding of God, God isn't primarily concerned with hilltops and temples and debates that divide. God is seeking those who would worship him in spirit and truth. He does perhaps the most grace-filled thing of all when he tells her that he is the Messiah, I want to tell you this morning that if you feel like you have been disqualified from God's love because of your sin, you need to take another look. If you think you're disqualified by the opinion that others have of you, take another look. If you think you're disqualified because other people have rejected you and used you and thrown you away, take another look. Take another look. Jesus is not afraid of your brokenness. Jesus is not worried that he'll be contaminated by your sin. He holds the cure in his hand. He's not afraid. Jesus doesn't care what other people think about you. He loves you. Jesus looks at the wounds you've, been, you've received from the world and he wants to heal them. He doesn't look and point fingers and laugh. He looks with an eye towards healing. So as we respond to the truth of this passage, first and foremost, I want to encourage you to stand before Jesus. Walls down. Heart open. He knows our hurts. He knows all about our sin, all about our past. There's no use hiding. We need to step into the light and be healed. And once we've done that, once we've received grace and mercy from Christ, it's time for us to extend it to other people. We've been asking these three questions as we're walking through these gospel stories in John. What does it look like for me to love and serve my neighbors like Jesus? What does it look like for me to step across those boundaries just like Jesus? To love anyways just like Jesus? The second question, what does it look like to love and serve my enemies like Jesus? The division between Samaritan and Jew were so sharp and so firm that there were plenty of people who would have said that the relationship between Jews and Samaritans was that of enemies. But it didn't stop Jesus from loving this woman, from loving the people in her community, from staying with them. The third question, who do I have a hard time loving and serving? Who is it? Who is
is it in my life that's difficult to love? Maybe it's because I have a hard time loving people that they identify with. Maybe it's because of their group. Maybe it's because I have a hard time with their personal choices. Maybe it's because we just don't get along. I don't like their personality. Whatever reason, what does it look like for us to reach out with love and grace anyway? What does it look like to love and serve my neighbor like Jesus? What does it look like to love and serve my enemy like Jesus? And who do I have a hard time loving and serving? Let's answer those questions in our hearts and minds, and let's lift those people up to the Lord and ask for him to do a work in us, to give us love and grace that surpasses any boundary, any wall. And let's invite God to bring healing to the places where we ourselves are broken so that we can comfort others with the comfort we've received.